without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Dwayne DeFries, um, who has been just an incredible champion for the Lagoon and has been a wealth of knowledge for all of us, I think, um, from our end, certainly. I think many of you are probably familiar with him, but for those of you who are not, um, here's Dwayne. Thank you, Zach. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and it will get going right away. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, appreciate you tuning in on this fine Wednesday evening. I'm gonna give you a kind of a look at where we are um, after almost a decade of, of challenges in the Indian River Lagoon. And I'm gonna move fairly quickly because both Keith and I wanna make sure you have a lot of time at the end of this webinar to ask questions. Uh, I took over the executive directorship for the IRL Council and Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program back in 2015. And uh, my staff and I are proud to serve you on this uh, very important time in history for the lagoon. And one of the challenges we see really is that we are different than any other estuary in North America. Uh, because we are so thin, we are shallow, we are microtidal, which means we don't have a lot of tidal flushing through our inlets. In fact, we don't have much tidal exchange uh, elevation-wise, even on the ocean side, compared to places like the Central East Coast and especially Rhode Island. Uh, but we are really three separate lagoonal estuaries, and a lagoon just means that we've got a barrier island that separates our estuary from our freshwater sources. And in this map, you can see kind of the light green outline of our watershed. It's a big watershed, and we encompass direct connection to five you know, major counties, the little bit of Palm Beach County on our southern end, and a good chunk of the eastern boundary of, of Okeechobee County. So we're a big watershed, a super narrow, shallow, uh, wind-driven system, and we have a very diverse set of communities. So the Volusia County experience is very much oriented towards Mosquito Lagoon. If you live down in the southern end in St. Lucie County, you know, Martin County, it's all about Lake Okeechobee in the southern end. Uh, but each one of these systems are very, very different. And each, this entire system is compartmentalized by well over 30 bridge and, and causeway spans. And so one of the things we like to say is we all have learned through school about downstream impacts. Ours is not downstream. So what happens up in Mosquito Lagoon isn't really impacting down in Melbourne where uh, most of you probably are. If uh, we have discharges from Lake Okeechobee, uh, those aren't impacting much past uh, really St. Lucie County. And we're very diverse in our communities, seven counties, million residents growing by double digits almost every year. And then we have 26 priority communities that are communities that span underrepresented, underserved, challenged economically. And so we are unique among estuaries in North America because we are way more vulnerable to the impacts that happen on land because what we put in the lagoon from land, whether it's litter or it's pollution, stays in the lagoon because we're so poorly flushed. And this is what it looks like when it goes bad. Uh, back in 2011, and we have always had algal blooms. It's part of a healthy estuary. Uh, but when you have too many nutrients, and nutrients really means fertilizers from non-natural sources, you can fertilize, just like you do your lawn, harmful algal blooms in both freshwater and also marine systems. And on the left side, you can see a microcystis a freshwater bloom that happened back in 2016 and 2018 down in the southern portion of the lagoon, and that was fed by Lake Okeechobee. In the center set of pictures, you can see our really intense brown tide bloom 
uh, which occurred back in 2016 through 18. But we had a really massive fish kill in 2016 around the Cocoa Beach area. And then in 2020, on that right-hand side, you can see another bloom. It looked really like pea soup green. And in the southern portion of this screen, you can see some of these other odd blooms that happen from time to time. You can't have a harmful algal bloom unless you have nutrients to fuel it. But to fuel these blooms, you also have to have the right conditions. Could be salinity, could be temperature, it could be water flow. But in the big picture, when conditions get right, things can go wrong really quickly. And we have seen that from 2011 uh, all the way up until about 2020. And because of those blooms, and you can see a history of seagrass coverage, uh, we were looking pretty good. Even though we were worried about water quality for many, many years, we had these seasonal blooms that occurred, uh, but they weren't dangerous or damaging to any great degree. And you can see right around 2009 and then going into 2011, that's when we began to bloom in recurring, and this is important, very intense and very long lasting blooms. And those blooms sh basically shaded out the light that was critical for seagrasses to grow. And you can see from 2010, 11, a big drop. Then we had a little bit of seagrass recovery in 2014 and 15. It was a very dry season. And then we collapsed basically with seagrasses starting around 2014 and 15 until we ultimately lost about 47,000 acres of seagrass. And you can see how many football fields that are on the slide, well over 80% of the coverage. And when you lose an essential habitat like seagrasses, it has impacts up and down the food chain and, and the food web, and we have seen that as well. And what's driving those impacts is largely what we're doing on land. There's no question that there are some seasonal impacts that we expect. And algal blooms are a natural occurring, you know, sequence on an estuary. Those little plankton species feed the fish and feed a lot of our filter feeders like clams and oysters. But we have grown and we have grown badly over the last 70 years where we used our coastal waters is basically a dumping point for both fresh water, fertilizer, and aging and inadequate wastewater treatment systems. You know, starting with wastewater treatment plants that haven't gotten upgrades uh, with a growing population, but also hundreds of thousands of septic tanks, uh, which all flow from the tank to the drain field bringing nutrients and those nutrients think of them as human based fertilizer so you want your lawn to be green you fertilize it well when you fertilize your lawn and you do it when in the rainy season that fertilizer runs into the street and when you add fertilizer whether it's agriculture or urban um, and these failing wastewater systems like septic systems and old uh, wastewater treatment plants that is the fuel that creates really intense and damaging algal blooms, and we call those harmful algal blooms. The result of that, of course, is that you don't have light penetrating where you have seagrasses. So you lose your seagrasses, and seagrasses are essential to species like manatees and a number of fish species. And so you begin to destabilize this system from the bottom up the top down, all because of what we do on land. And then when sediments come through with that rainfall, every time it rains down the street, you know, our lawns are driving these fine sediments that create human-based muck. And it's an interesting phenomenon, but muck will actually create its own nutrients and cycle within the system and no seagrasses can grow in muck. So we have destabilized 
a natural estray in about 70 years. And a lot of it has to do with human impacts on land, direct human impacts on water, and also air deposition. So we can get nutrients from atmospheric deposition as well. So the key to solving this problem is to look at the sources of these nutrients and the sources of non-natural fresh water flows and to start to manage them uh, through better infrastructure and also stormwater management that retains that water rather than running it off our roads and streets into the system. So back over 30 years ago, uh, the Indian River Lagoon was designated as one of now 28 estuaries of national significance. That dedication happened as part of a congressional act in the Clean Water Act called Section. Every five years we get reauthorized and we are very unusual compared to most systems that you see in federal government. We are not regulatory. Back when this program was started, Congress recognized that the one of the ways to address estuaries in need is to bring all of the stakeholders together and work together as a fully comprehensive community to solve the problems. We are science-based, we're collaborative, we're inclusive, uh, but we are funded from the top down and bottom up simultaneously and we build consensus with those community partners in order to help make decisions on planning and infrastructure. In 2015, because of a really bad algal bloom, uh, we call the super bloom, and then nine years of blooms thereafter that caused all that seagrass loss, we restructured this program uh, under a new special district of the state of Florida called the IRL Council. It's an interlocal agreement. Now it's got five counties, two water management districts, and Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And these partners each year bring the dollar amounts that you see in the pie chart to form the basis of our operational revenues. And then we work with not just these partners, but our volunteer communities in order to build a management plan. And we also chase dollars when dollars become available. So we use that and leverage that national identity in order to find additional funds. And I'm really happy to say that a couple of years ago, uh, we were able to get ourselves inserted into the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, that line item brought $132 million to the National Estuary Program nationwide. Uh, which is delivering $909,800 each year for five years for the Indian River Lagoon. And those all those dollars get managed through the IRL Council as the host agency for the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. Uh, we also have additional revenue streams and one that's uh, relatively old, uh, but just recently updated is the Indian River Lagoon license plate uh, on average, it's been bringing about $125,000 a year in revenue. Those revenues are dedicated uh, to the counties where the license plate is purchased. And you can see we've just updated the artwork. The National Estuary Program is now managing that effort. And all of those dollars, with the exception of 5%, uh, stay in the counties where those plates are bought. 5% can be used for marketing and advertising. No dollars are used for scientific research or administration or other uses. They're all going to local projects. And we restructured one of the most unique aspects of national estuary programs. We are authorized by Congress to create what's called a management conference. And our management conference is a form of governance where you bring all the stakeholders into the room and you work together in a collaborative management atmosphere. And we've got a number of Brevard Zoo players. Keith sits on the Citizen Advisory Committee. Uh, one of his resource managers is sitting on our management board. Uh, but if you look at this chart, our Science Advisory Committee, the STEM Advisory Committee, 
the Citizens Advisory Committee, Management Board. Collectively, there's over 100 volunteers. All the business goes through those citizen volunteer groups and then are brought to our Council Board of Directors uh, for action. So we are a collaborative governance model. And then we reach out when we need to, uh, to other scientists, other citizen groups, uh, even industry, to try to build a full coalition for ecosystem restoration in the lagoon. And in 2024, we're doing that with eight full-time equivalent staff members. Three are relatively new, representing uh, community engagement coordinators for the North, Central, and South Lagoon. Also, when we reorganize, we change the vision, the mission, and the promise. And really the most important here for me, coming from industry originally, um, is the mission statement. We recognize we had a lot of scientists, had a lot of citizens who knew a lot about the lagoon, but we weren't speaking as a single lagoon, as a single community, and with a single voice. And that is a culture change uh, that we still work on eight years after we created the IRL Council. Uh, but we, I'm going to show you, we are collaborating at levels we never had previously, and we expect that to improve over time as we move forward. Working together, we create a 10-year comprehensive conservation management plan. Uh, that plan is going to start being updated for a five-year update this year. Citizens will get to weigh in on our website once that starts. But that plan goes through our process, goes through our board, and then goes to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency uh, for their certification as a 10-year document with five-year updates. And that's online. It's pretty readable. But the most important single page is this. We identified 32 vital signs of an Indian River Lagoon. And what makes us very different than a lot of other programs is that we incorporate the human element and the economic element and the infrastructure element into our planning documents. So the comprehensive management plan, each chapter represents one of these spokes of the wheel. And when you get all 32 spokes working simultaneously and getting the work done, you will have a healthy lagoon, uh, both environmentally uh, and socially and economically. And we continue to update that process as we move forward. Oops. Wanted to show you where the dollars go. Um, when you saw that pie chart earlier, you probably first thought, well, that's not a lot of money. And the fact is it isn't. Um, our budgets typically run between two and three million dollars a year and every year we distribute a good portion of those funds uh, into competitive grants among our partners and stakeholders and this is the from 2015 the beginning of the IRL council to 220 2023 we funded 195 projects 14.6 million dollars and what's really interesting is each year it's different uh, but on average, we're looking at a six to one local match. So all of our cities and counties are engaged with us in delivering these projects. And each year we choose which projects get funded uh, through a competitive basis. If you want to look back at what's happening, you know, in the past, we have an interactive map, brand new um, as of this year. It goes all the way back to fiscal year 16. You can pull up any one of those dots, see exactly who did the work, where the funding came from, who were the partners, and you can connect to the actual quarterly reports and final reports. So you can get a sense of the history of the work that's being done. And Brevard Zoo has been a major partner in this large partnership effort. And when you think about over 100 volunteers representing dozens and dozens of organizations. One of the most important parts of our partnerships are with our nonprofit organizations who very much are out there doing the work with volunteers. 
Sometimes we hear, well, nobody's really working. This is the other side of the coin, not what the National Estuary Program is funded, uh, but what is funded from other places with other partners. And just last year, uh, we had over 300 projects underway. In the last three years, 870 projects. Everybody is at an all hands moment doing work to improve water quality, habitat, species recovery, uh, economic development. And so we have reached that point where I'm really comfortable to say, we are working together, we're communicating well, we're coordinating well, and we're paying attention to how that business gets done. And I thought it'd be interesting, uh, neither Keith or his team at Brevard Zoo have seen the history, so I went back and we pulled up the history of funding for Brevard Zoo projects. And we're proud to say Brevard Zoo is one of our really active partners going all the way back to 2007. And you can see when we were still managed under the St. John's River Water Management District, five projects that had already started restoration or education or outreach and then a significant increase with our increased funding when we created the IRL Council. Uh, since 2016, 858,000 has been funded, including Restore Our Shores, Oyster Reef Restoration, Lagoon Quest, and most recently, Seagrass Nurseries to do some seagrass recovery and research work. So overall, over a million dollars has moved through the National Estuary Program to Brevard Zoo. One other point I wanna make is that this isn't just about environmental investment. This is also about investing in a workforce, not just a paid workforce, but a volunteer workforce. And Keith may mention it, but thousands of volunteers join Brevard Zoo every year in doing this restoration and education work. And we wouldn't be successful in what we do at the NEP without those volunteers and without our nonprofit partners. We also have set up an infrastructure vision, uh, and Keith's going to talk a little bit more about this when he speaks. Uh, but we recognize that we had four major nonprofit or education partners that were doing the full spectrum of restoration, research, and education. And so we designated those in our comprehensive conservation and management plan in 2019 as the framework, the human and infrastructure framework for doing restoration and education. And it included the Marine Discovery Center up in New Smyrna Beach, Brevard Zoo, um, which is really now going to be multiple locations. Uh, we've got Sea and Shoreline not as a regional partner, but as a seagrass restoration partner. Uh, the FAU campus at Harbor Branch and down in Martin County, Florida Oceanographic Society. So we have three formal agreements that we've entered into this regional rest restoration center designation, identifying some new federal funds through the Bipartisan Infrastructure and Investment Act, half of those five years of funding are going to create a seagrass restoration network. And then just most recently, a memorandum of agreement uh, with Brevard Zoo and the IRL Council for the Aquarium Dollar for Conservation Program. And Keith, um, I'm assuming you're gonna talk about that when, when you do your presentation. We are excited about this partnership and we're excited about all of our partners, but Brevard Zoo has stepped up to the plate in ways that I think when I first was with Brevard Zoo back in its early couple of years, I never would imagine where we are today and where Brevard Zoo is in the whole world of conservation of both wildlife and habitat. We're also chasing money. And this one I wanna mention, it's a very heavy lift. We're not sure we're gonna get these funds, but we've joined with 15 partner organizations, including Brevard Zoo, to do multiple restoration targets along the lagoon. I'm hoping we hear on funding on this sometime, you know, maybe in the next six or eight weeks, 
Uh, but we recognize that if you do multiple species restoration, you increase the likelihood for success and you invest in the biodiversity, which is a hallmark of this lagoon. So you can see seagrasses, oyster reefs, wetlands, fish reefs, living shorelines, clams, and the annual community volunteer effort just for this single proposal is over 2,000 volunteers a year. And our friends at uh, Brevard Zoo are in the, in the 10 plus thousand on volunteers, uh, depending on how far you wanna go back. Wanna just mention this, we are taking a big gamble and a big scientific step to better understand seagrass and seagrass restoration in a system that's lost almost 90% of its seagrass uh, biomass since 2011 because of harmful algal blooms. And if any of you who are listening here, well, the water's not good enough, you know, you, you're never going to replant successfully. On the lower right hand side, you can see a replanting of Florida Oceanographic Society. And you can see the areas around that net where the planting did not occur. And then on the left hand side, and you can see in the middle, on the top is the Brevard Zoo, uh, new seagrass nursery at Coconut Point. Right below it, the seagrass nursery um, at Harbor Branch. We don't expect to replant our way through well over 40,000 acres of loss. But what we're hoping to do is to be able to accelerate recovery, especially in areas where recovery isn't happening on its own and also to learn a lot about seagrasses and what makes them flower, you know, what makes them seed and what makes them hardier in certain circumstances. And many of you may not know, but we have seven species of seagrasses. Really only three dominate the seascape. And we're gonna focus on those three. I would be remiss not to mention this program. Those of you who are from Brevard County, thank you. Uh, there is no program that I'm aware of at a county level that's doing more for an estuary than the voter-approved Save Our Indian River Lagoon half-cent sales tax uh, that was created back in 2016 by Brevard County voters. It's going to bring in north of $500 million over its 10-year life cycle. Over 20% of that is being paid by tourist uh, sales tax dollars. And the new 2024 plan is available for review now. So if you wanna see the projects that get lined up each year, uh, go ahead and go online and you can see a really good science-based plan. It's my personal hope that we see a second 10 years of this effort because we are right at the beginning of this restoration and stewardship effort. And we're trying to not only get in front of uh, the last 60, 70 years, but prepare for the growth that's happening now with 800 to 1,000 residents. We're also seeing incredible uh, investment at the state level, both investment in infrastructure uh, and investment in funding and also regulation. So back in 2020, the Clean Waterways Act really started to reset the regulatory tone for clean water in, in Florida. The Resilient Florida program since 21 has been building resilient communities to sea level rise and climate change and building plans for vulnerability. But most important, I think, for the Indian River Lagoon was last year, the IRL protection program. Uh, in 23, 100 million was appropriated to 21 water quality improvement projects. And this year, uh, once the House and Senate sent over uh, the budget that was just passed uh, in Tallahassee just a little over a week ago. We'll wait on the governor's signature, but that budget is at $75 million to support the IRL protection program. These are historic levels of funding uh, at a level we I haven't seen in the 40 plus years I've been in Florida. And if you hear the naysayers say it, you know, it's never gonna come back, the lagoon is dead. We saw really 
surprising recovery this year in certain segments of the lagoon. And this is up in the mos southern part of the Mosquito Lagoon. And it looked like the old days, the days that I remember. It, sadly, it wasn't like that throughout the system, but we saw some recovery throughout the entire lagoon this year. And just as a caveat, we are going to see good years and bad years. We're gonna see growth years and decline years. But if we can keep the general trend towards increasing both the acreage and the coverage, uh, we'll be moving in the right direction, uh, both for seagrasses, but also all those dependent species like manatees, spotted sea trout, and our fisheries. And I'm going to finish with these last two slides. This kind of work can't be done without community support, community engagement, and a shared vision for our future. And in order to do that, we have to continually ask about how much money do we need to do the work? Where are we gonna get those funds? And also make sure those funds are used responsibly and wisely. And we do our best at the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program to build that coalition, to keep track of who's doing what, and make sure we're communicating, collaborating, coordinating, and most importantly, uh, looking forward to the way we can share both our human resources and our financial resources. And I'm gonna turn it over to Keith with this. I've been on this system for 43 years. I'm like the old guard, I don't know how it happened so fast. And there's a lot happening right now that are, it's really important infrastructure, but there is no single more important project in the Brevard County portion of the Indian River Lagoon and Banana River uh, than the Brevard Zoo Aquarium. And on the southern end of the lagoon, it's all about Lake Okeechobee restoration and stopping those dangerous and damaging discharges uh, that are gonna start up in another few days, I understand, from Lake Okeechobee through the St. Lucie Estuary and into the southern Indian River Lagoon. So with that, Keith, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Before I get started, and um, Dwayne, if you want to unshape, before I get started with my sort of slides, I want to touch on four points that I think make it hard for us to always wrap our brains around the challenges facing the Indian River Lagoon. Um, and it is hard. I mean, uh, Dwayne is really the established expert. I'm a relative newcomer, having been at this for about 19 years. Um, and there's complexities here that are always hard to understand. But let me touch on four points before I sort of formally walk me through what the zoo is doing. Um, first of all, the, the saving the lagoon uh, is an and problem. Dwayne and I talk about this a lot. You have to address this and this and this and this. You went over a whole litany of problems. And anyone who tells you there's a silver bullet, there's just one solution, either doesn't understand the complexity of the lagoon or has their own agenda or is bought into somebody else's agenda. We have to address multiple things simultaneously because of the complexity of the system. Number two, um, as you talked about, progress in the lagoon is non-linear. Uh, it's lumpy, as we might say. It goes up and down, good years and bad years. But really, to address the lagoon, we do need consistent funding to do the work. You can't have the funding stopping and starting every time things look good or things look bad. And that's another issue that makes it challenging for people to wrap their brain around. They might see lots of dollars being invested, but the lagoon could look really bad this winter, look really good next summer. It's up and down. Um, and it will be for many years. Um, number third point is that, you know, we're doing sort of experimental work and what I call production work, tested work at the same time. And that's also hard for people to wrap their brains around. There are proven things we need to keep investing in, and we have to try new techniques at the same time um, in order to make progress. And lastly, as much as everyone would love to tie a bow around things and say we're done at some point, it is a giant bathtub. And we will never be done. We will have to keep our eyes on the lagoon forever because as more people move here, there's more impact. New issues come from around the world. So this is a long-term problem that we need to set up structures that address it over the long term. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing at the zoo um, to try to address it. Dwayne's been exceptionally generous in, in his praise for us. And we've really done this all in partnership. Um, 
we're looking long term. So we're calling this our legacy campaign. Very briefly, we're a nonprofit. We're very proud to be part of Brevard County, but um, in terms of being here, but we're completely independent. Um, and we really are a community zoo. So we try to address the issues the community aims at us and connects with us. And that's how we got involved with the Indian River Lagoon. We have a program called Restore Our Shores, which is really and in deeply involved um, in shoreline restoration efforts and restoring the ecosystem services that have traditionally been in the lagoon. We can do a lot, but nature is incredibly resilient if you empower those organisms and those systems that help. I'm gonna give a quick overview of those, really four sort of areas we work, uh, oyster gardening, um, adopt the mangrove living shoreline, sort of our out of the water plant piece, um, clam restoration, we're big into bivalves, and then seagrass nurseries are sort of in, in water farming. And as Dwayne mentioned, we do this in partnership. We've actually combined and worked with 85,000 plus volunteers over the years. That's the power that we bring is our ability to connect with people. Um, so many different tools at Bay. And one thing I'd like you to think about is we have two natural filter systems in the lagoon, and those are oysters and clams. Oysters do very well with lower salinity and more fresh water. Clams do much better with higher salinity. So you need both those tools depending on the conditions in the lagoon. We've been doing oyster reefs the longest time, 89 oyster reefs, as you've seen. We do shuck and share where we recycle oyster shells from restaurants. And yes, that's a great way to engage people. But oyster shells are sort of like gold. Baby oysters, the little larvae, swoon through the water. Their favorite thing to land on is actually on oyster shells and set up shop. We do living shorelines, uh, where that's where we restore the natural buffer systems. We do a couple of tools with that. You know, we work with mangroves and people, and we do a piece where people can take mangroves home and then bring them back, really deeply connect them that way. And now we're planning sort of more integrated buffer zones that capture that runoff before it comes into the lagoon. We've been trained, you see all these people who have lovely grass right up to the lagoon. It's really no way to prevent the fertilizer and other things we use to fall in. If you do that, um, you can do buffer zones and ways to do that. Our teams work with people to make those differences. And by the way, that little butterfly you see down there, it's an Atala butterfly. It's a butterfly species that almost went extinct and has come back because of the use of native landscaping here. Clam restoration. Uh, at one point, a professor from the University of Florida spent a whole summer in the Brevard Basin, only found 30 plus clams, was able to take them to a clam hatchery and, and basically produce them. And so the zoo has been experimenting with clams as another one of those filter tools. Um, we've put in over a hundred clam gardens over three different counties. And again, we're experimenting and learning um, exactly what's going on at the same time. Um, we're trying new techniques that can be basically accelerated up. Um, and finally, seagrass. If you had told me a couple of years ago we'd be in the seagrass building business, I would have been saying kicking and screaming. Um, we did some early work with seagrass up at the Merritt Island um, Airport. And man, everything eats seagrass. As quickly as you plant it, something eats it. It's a real challenge. And yet, Dwayne has pulled together a consortium of really five groups. They're starting to wrap our arms around seagrass. We've stood up two seagrass nurseries. Because one of the things the zoo gets to bring to the to the to the table, so to speak. We're not a university. We don't rely purely on grants. We're not governmental. Uh, we can move relatively quickly. We can take people's investment in the zoo and turn it into facilities like these two seagrass nurseries that we've happened. Um, and we've planted 16 sites so far. We're starting to get a sense of what works and what doesn't. As Dwayne said, we're not gonna plant our way out of this, but we do need to know what's gonna have to happen to restore seagrass as water clarity improves. Is there a seed bank lying there waiting to basically flow out of the substrate or are we gonna to need to help it along? And we need to, as I said, experiment at the same time that we produce. And someone asked, I saw a couple things about volunteering and we will get you information on that. Um, you can visit our Restore Our Shores um, and then lots of lagoon friendly choices to work there. But we have lots of answers to those questions as a homeowner, uh, how do you wanna work and how do you wanna make a difference? So let me talk a little bit about our big answer to some of these problems. And that goes back to the sustainable approach that we've been looking at. 
how do we keep a focus on the lagoon? The folks in the 80s, they used to dump 50 to 80 million gallons a day of raw sewage, not raw, it was treated, but it still had heavy nutrients into the lagoon. And the folks who solved that problem rightfully thought they were done. They had solved the problem, the lagoon was saved. Uh, much to their dismay, as population came in, other problems you know, basically popped up. And so we're looking for the long-term, some sort of facility that keeps focus on the lagoon, trains the next generation, coordinates effort, and that is the aquarium project that Dwayne referred to a few times. Um, and here's our goal. Uh, it will be hopefully a world-class aquarium. It's at a site half an hour away from the zoo. Um, it will educate over half a million people a year. It will be a major ongoing funder. Um, it'll engage people in a way they care about the lagoon, um, and it'll address specific problems. Um, here's the site. This is a piece of property right south of 528 opposite the port. Um, and you've probably driven by it a dozen times if you live up this way. Never noticed this 24 acres that's sitting there right on the Banana River, right by a beautiful um, rookery. Um, we actually have options to lease and develop 14 acres of it. Right now, it's a construction rubble site for the port. It's where they pull concrete out of the port. That's where they dump it. This is what it looks like. A lot of people ask us, where's the aquarium? Because it's a campus. Uh, as totally built out with 12 different buildings. A couple of the pieces that happen here at the zoo, we try to model caring for the community. So we do have a sea turtle, the L3 Harris um, uh, Animal Care Center here with a sea turtle hospital. You can't see it here at the zoo, um, but you'll be able to see it inside out us in action um, at the one we're going to be bringing at the aquarium. We're also adding a manatee critical care center. Obviously, after the mass mortality events, we got deeply involved in manatees. We will be building an initial facility at the zoo this year. That's an acute care center. It works with stabilized manatee. The critical care center will be able to take the sort of most impacted manatees and take care of them. And again, show people the work that we do and get them engaged. And we're very proud that the conservation hub there, it's a three-story building sitting on the parking lot. Um, it doesn't charge admission. Anyone can use it. We have all sorts of facilities in it. Uh, that's named after Dr. Dwayne DeFries, as it fittingly should be, in recognition of the incredible work that he's done in getting people aware of the lagoon. It includes things like wet labs, training the next generation, all sorts of facilities for universities. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you know, why it matters, I think we've already made that point today, but the aquarium as we envision it does all of these things. Here's where we stand with the project. Um, we got into a grid with Port Canaveral in September of 2021. This is a, a multi-regional you know, project. So we're deeply engaged talking to people throughout the region, Indian River County, Orange County, Volusia County, as well as Brevard County. We've been out there talking to people, 14,000 plus people. We want everyone to know about it. And we're about $78 million committed to date. So we are well on our way but we have quite a few funds to still raise. Our plan is to break ground by the end of this year. And I just wanna to touch one more moment on sort of current impact, what it's led to. We mentioned this a few times, you know, while we're building things, we're doing things. Um, so there's a new aqua science program at Cocoa, um, Cocoa Beach Junior Senior High School. Um, we've stood up a consortium with Florida Tech. Um, it's called CARE. It's the Center for Aquarium Research and Education, and they're going to be managing sort of research projects, bringing in universities from across the region that will be centered at the aquarium and use unique resources there. We've committed a dollar of every paid admittance to the aquarium, which is upwards of hopefully half a million dollars a year, will be going to the National Estuary Program as another funding source for them to give long-term grants across the whole length of the lagoon. Um, and we're creating this sort of taking all of this data that exists here into a visualization table that you can come to the Dr. Dwayne DeFries um, uh, Coastal Conservation Hub and actually ask those questions and get them answered. Um, so we called it our legacy because this is really our future caring for the lagoon. And of course, I want to end on that theme that, you know, the famous quote, from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. 
Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. In this case, it's a large group of citizens that have changed the world and hopefully will continue to do it. Um, and we do have some upcoming opportunities to learn more. If you're in Indy River County, uh, we have a conservation symposium happening on April 9th. And with that, I'm going to stop the share and turn it back over to our moderators to answer some of your questions. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Keith and Dwayne. That was absolutely fantastic. And thank you for everybody for your engagement throughout. Lots of questions and um, things coming through the chat. We really appreciate all of that. Um, some of you we've gotten back to individually, um, if it was more of a, a specific question. Um, but we do want to make sure that we take some time for questions now. So we have some questions that were submitted um, via email and some other venues um, once we announce the webinar, and then the ones that have been coming through the chat as well. So we will go through some of these, give both Keith and Dwayne a chance to answer them. Um, you guys can kind of jump back and forth between them on you. If you start rambling too much, I'll, I'll mute you. Actually, I don't, I don't think I even have that power. They wouldn't trust me with it, but uh, um, we'll pass these on to you guys. Um, and then we'll work through as many as we possibly can. Um, please feel free to continue to submit questions through the chat. Um, and if we can't get to them, we'll try and include some answers um, when we send out a follow-up because we will send up a follow-up email that will include a link to the recording um, because there have been some questions about how to get the recording after the um, after the webinar is over. We will make sure that that is included once it's been uploaded. Um, so we'll try and get to any of those remainder questions within that email as well. So, um, all right. So first question, um, our, we have um, a lot of talk about seagrass and this was one that was spent ahead of time via email. Um, I think it was kind of touched on a little bit, um, Dwayne, during your presentation and, and also Keith and yours, but um, there's been a couple other questions about seagrass as well and the loss of seagrass. And so how successful have these plantings been? Are there, you know, the specific areas, the, the Southern Mosquito Lagoon, some of these areas that are are showing um, resurgent growth, growth on their own, um, are there things that we're learning about those areas that are, might help us key in on the road to success in some of the areas where we're not seeing so much seagrass regrowth. Keith, you want me to jump first and then you can talk what, about- the Why don't you garden. jump first, yeah. So we began uh, funding seagrass restoration back in 2018 with 100% knowledge that we were gonna fail more than we would succeed. Water quality wasn't really where we thought it needed to be. Uh, but we knew that if we didn't start that process, we wouldn't be able to differentiate, you know, why you fail versus why you succeed. And very often you learn more from the failure. So this is what we know so far. Seagrass restoration is complicated. It's very, very expensive, but it can be successfully done if you pay attention to really three major parameters. One is that you're replanting in a location that historically had seagrass. Number two, you're not replanting in an area of disturbance that is going to really do damage to you. And that could be anything from a stormwater discharge or right next to a heavily trafficked boating channel where you get wave action. And number three, which was interesting to us, is that seagrass restoration does much better if you put cages or herbivore devices to cut down on the, you know, not just manatees, but sea turtles, the critters that actually will feed on seagrasses. And it's almost like if you planted your front yard, but then you went ahead right after you put those plants in and brought 15, you know, herbivores, whether it's cattle, you know, they're going to eat faster than those seagrasses can grow. What's really interesting now, and this is not published yet, but it looks like those cages also help to stabilize the sediment so you don't have destabilized sediments 
which will give give those young plants a chance to root better and grow faster. Uh, but there's a cost to those cages, and you want water flow. Too much water flow, you know, is is disruptive. Too little water flow is also disruptive. So we're learning as we go, uh, but there's no question we've had surprising success in areas where your first thought would be, wow, this water quality isn't that good. And so we are starting to narrow down on what those parameters would be, you know, for the right site. But the one thing we can't control is where harmful algal blooms happen. And so you can have perfect water for three years. And this happened just this last year. The worst water clarity we had uh, going from August to September this last year was north and south of Sebastian Inlet. And uh, some of our weakest seagrass rebound has been around the inlets, partly because of you know, what's flowing out of the tributaries on the freshwater outgoing tide, but some of it is just mechanical destabilization. So yes, we can do it. We're getting better every year, uh, but Keith mentioned it and I'll mention it again. Now, we're not gonna replant our way out of 40 plus thousand acres. We may help accelerate that recovery, but the key to seagrass is really clean water, getting the water quality right. And, and let me just summarize, when you think about seagrass, you think about four factors. Clean water, which means it gets the sun. The substrate, like the soil, what's it growing in? And we're still learning a lot about substrate impacts. Um, uh, number, number three is basically, is there plant matter there to grow? Are there a seed bank? Are there seeds ready to grow under the right conditions or do we need to plant the plants? And last is predation. You can see the complexity of managing all four of those things to be successful. And that's what we're learning about. Wonderful, thank you both. Um, all right, so this one uh, kind of goes a little bit of a different direction. Um, there have been some recent articles that have come out um, on sinking coastal land masses as if we didn't have enough to worry about with the ocean coming up now we're seeing articles come out about the land going down um you know florida we sit on a big bed of limestone and sandstone and it's it's pretty soft and you know i know my the my old house was on basically a big sand dune um and and nothing more so um with the concerns about, you know, the existing concerns about increasing sea level rise, you know, the predicted increase in severity of storms. Um, what is, what can planners do? What are planners doing um, to help build resiliency for things like, you know, the aquarium project and other projects that are being built along our, you know, coastal waterways in an area like Brevard County? I'll touch on the aquarium and then I'll turn it over to, to Dwayne. You know, every site is different and um, the opposite of, of resilience is retreat. And that is something you can use strategically in some places. I don't think our barrier islands in Brevard County, for example, lend themselves to that. But the aquarium site itself, the good news is it's a high site. Uh, we're building it about eight feet above sea level. The major highway leading there is way above sea level. We're building for as much resilience as we can. So no, we know that site will be you know, relatively safe in the scale of things for the next 50 to 100 years. But there are bigger issues, you know, you can't control. Um, but there are strategies that communities are doing. Um, Satellite Beach is an excellent example. Looking ahead, planning, um, Cape City of Cape Canaveral, same thing, trying to use systems to move the water around. I'll defer to Duane on more details beyond the site. We've chosen a site partially because we know of its resilience to sea level rise. No, Keith, you're right. Making sure when you build that your elevations are going to give you the window of elevation protection uh, based on the models. And the models are getting better and better every year. Uh, NOAA, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, has some great models. The question about subsidence is very challenging because subsidence is different even in the state of Florida. So down in uh, Miami, their rate of subsidence is very different than what you would see, you know, in central Florida on the East Coast. And so you really have to do the work. City of Cape Canaveral has got a really good 2019 report looking at their coastal vulnerability. So a couple things as you think about 
construction, whether it's a small home or an aquarium, is that you have to build in at least knowledge of your risk. You have to build that into your design, you know, considerations. And one of the areas that you can really protect yourself because the immediate impacts uh, won't be the sea level rise. It will be those tiny incremental increases during hurricanes or tropical storms or northeast storms. And so the property that is planned for the aquarium is a perfect site to do a shoreline restoration using living shorelines. It's got a an angle that isn't going to be super vulnerable uh, to most wind conditions. But there's no question if you should, nobody should be building on any coastal property without taking full consideration of sea level rise, storm and flooding vulnerabilities, uh, infrastructure, uh, and, and you can build a lot of resilience into those efforts. And there's some really good examples around the state of Florida uh, where communities have done that and really weathered the storm better than communities that haven't. But it is definitely a new consideration where you have to look long game. So it's not about the next five or 10 years. It's what are you going to look at down the line to the life cycle of your building itself? So while we're talking about climate change and sea level rise, looking at it from a structural standpoint and a community standpoint, um, how do these same you know trends and predictions impact the future of restoration work and an estuary like the lagoon? I mean, obviously there is a, a huge amount of uncertainty, um, but are there things to expect or plan for with some of the you know most um, most agreed upon predictions and how that may impact um, the work that's being done with the lagoon and our ability to return it to a state of what it was. Keith, you want to jump first or you want me? Um, I'm going to say one brief thing and then you'll go into the more technical aspect. One of the things we know from watching systems around the world is there's always some unexpected um, perturbations that hurt your systems, but there's also resilience opportunities you don't always see. So it seems so unpredictable. We don't know what the future will hold, except we know that it will affect things in both ways, potentially in a negative and positive, and that we can count on. Now I'll turn it over to Dwayne to actually give you the research detail on that. But So this is gonna be kind of, kind of counterintuitive for many people, especially those who are listening that may be scientists. We spent two years looking um, at the Indian River Lagoon from the lagoon perspective. It was the climate ready estuary plan uh, that the EPA had structured for national estuary programs. And most of those plans spent a lot of time on, you know, looking at temperature, looking at something called ocean acidification, changing pH. Uh, and we asked the really hard question of our contractors and partners on that project. We want to drill that down to what we can do as local communities. And what turned out is that the best way to build climate resilience into the Indian River Lagoon is to fix the plumbing, the vulnerable plumbing, the kinds of things that disrupt social and economic stability. So wastewater systems that will break down in a hurricane, septic systems that will flood uh, streets that flood and bring sediment and debris. And at the end of a very long two-year process, I forget there was 470-something stressors. We na really narrowed it down to nine. And that is if you work on the hard infrastructure of wastewater, stormwater, even transportation, that's the best way to build resilience into the Indian River Lagoon itself. Uh, but what we remember, especially what old guys like me remember from 43 years ago when I got down here. And by the way, I saw the lagoon when I was six years old. Don't remember much, but it wasn't the same as when I got here, you know, back in 78. We will not return this system to what we remember. 
The goal is to build stability and the end game is very simple. What are that safe to swim? Fish and clams and crabs that are safe to eat, you know, and a system uh, that has human populations that are resilient to the storm, whether that storm is a hurricane that happens over a few days or a week, uh, or the long game of climate change and sea level rise. Uh, climate change is tough. We're already seeing those impacts today, and it's going to impact us short term, mid term, and long term. And you saw it this winter with one of the most powerful La Nina years we've seen in a long time. And so that's the challenge is building resilience into the human and natural system so we can adapt to these changes. So Speaking of that restoration and this idea of you know not being able to restore it to what we remember, um, manatee population. I mean, we lost. There were you know we had a huge two years of losing manatees, um, which you know really catapulted so much attention to seagrass issues um, from you know national attention. Um, two issues that, you know, we were, you know, kind of staring here, obviously already seeing, but all of a sudden it got so much attention to it. Um, but with the, with the massive die-offs of, of seagrass and of manatees, um, at what point in restoration will we, you know, will we be able to see those manatee populations come back or what are we from a restoration standpoint? Is there even an idea, an understanding of what a current carrying capacity for the lagoon with manatees is? Are we ever going to see those numbers that we had 10 years ago? Um, what does a restored manatee herd or population in the lagoon look like? I'll jump in first. Uh, Mother Nature is going to take care of this uh, beyond our management control. Uh, when you lose the forage capacity of an animal like manatees who depend on seagrasses, you are going to have a decline in that population. It's no different than buffalo or deer. And so when I first got to Florida, I think there was just above 2,000 manatees. The last I heard, which is just a few weeks ago, were a little above 8,000, somewhere between eight and 9,000. Uh, we lost 2,000 during that unusual mortality event in 2020 December through 21 and into 22, the system is going to stabilize itself. And it's really hard to overcome those ecosystem trajectories in a food web. Uh, but we are already now starting to see delayed impacts in fisheries. Um, and so the key is you try to restore water quality as fast as you can, you try to restore what you can, recover what you can. And Keith will mention some of the efforts with manatees, I think, with the new aquarium in the zoo. Try to save what you can when you can. Uh, but the carrying capacity is not something you're going to really impact from the outside in. And those populations will adjust to those living conditions that they're in. And I think we already saw that. In the sense yeah. that, you know, the, the manatees, there was a big manatee loss. We did a manatee health assessment last December. Zach, I don't know if you were involved in that, but I know that previous years, pretty much one year, almost every manatee that we assessed had to be pulled out of the water because it was in such terrible shape. And I believe the last assessment we did in December, 13 manatees, all of them looked healthy and four were pregnant. Um, so um, the bottom line is, the system did regulate itself. There are fewer manatees, less pressure. Seagrass came back in certain areas. That doesn't mean you're not going to see another mass um, mortality event in the future. We well could, but the population already stabilized, um, and we did see much healthier manatees. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, so let's go um, into the realm of um, kind of some of these current projects that are being – that are in process parts of the NEP programs and the SORO programs. Um, 
we have muck removal going on. We have uh, septic to sewer conversions. Um, and then at the same time, we have new construction happening. And some of that new construction has septic, some of it has sewer. Um, and there is a lot of a lot of mixed kind of confusion, I think, within the community with some of the um some of what's going on with the the new construction. Why, you know, where are um is it that regulations are being ignored or not enforced? Or um, are there additional regulations that need to be made? So I think um, one sort of with the regulations for new things coming in, um, are they strict enough and being enforced enough to deal with the population increase we're seeing locally? And then on the other side for kind of removing everything from the historic stuff, um, are we with muck removal and the current rate of septic to sewer switchover, um, are we doing it? Are we doing it fast enough? Can we do it fast enough to to keep up with with what's coming in? Um, and what is you know what does that pace need to look like over the next five years, ten years, um, however long? That's a Dwayne question. So the answer is no. We're not doing it fast enough, and and the reason it's not fast enough is that every year we don't make big progress is another year that costs go up. We've seen this with Everglades restoration. However, there's some, what I would call plumbing problems that don't happen fast, even if you have the money. And so the key is to understand what I would call the push points of, you know, whether it's stormwater or wastewater or muck dredging. You know, get the biggest bang for the buck and move as quickly as possible to do those projects. Because right now we are very much kind of solving the problems that have been left over after 60, 70 years of not great decisions. And a lot of the infrastructure that we're working on is old and aging infrastructure. So that's number one. Uh, right now, the estimates I hear, and they vary depending on who you believe, 800 to 1,000 people move into the state of Florida every day. Uh, we need to be doing growth differently than we did in the 60s and 70s. There are some really good examples, and there are some not so good examples. And this is going to be a ground up issue. Every single municipality needs to be taking a hard look at their comprehensive plans. And for example, low impact development shouldn't be a voluntary you know, issue. That ought to be a mandatory development requirement because it's gonna be better and cheaper in the long run to do it right the first time than to underbuild and then have flooding and have that flooding go to the lagoon. Uh, we need to find more diversified revenue streams and there's a lot of work to be done in private-public partnerships. Uh, but the, the general answer is we need to do more. We need to do it faster. But for the first time in my career, I am guardedly optimistic that at least at the moment, water is front and center in the public eye. And in the public eye will demand what our elected officials do, whether it's Tallahassee or Congress. And so the public will for clean water and healthy estuaries needs to be a constant pressure for investment. And just to throw out a number that's a bit old, uh, but for every dollar you spend in restoration, this is based on Regional Planning Council study in 2016 for the lagoon, somewhere around $33 of value is contributed back, whether that's real estate value, direct positive impacts to tourism. Uh, when you have dirty water and dead fish, trust me, that repels business, repels economies, repels new young professionals who wanna move here. And, and if it's beautiful and fishable and swimmable, that's gonna help the economy and that's going to help us build kind of a really robust and, and healthy community as well. 
So you got to look past the cost to long-term value. And we have those numbers if anybody's interested. And, and I think one really key factor we often forget is the true cost of sewage treatment. And, and the true cost of sewage treatments means that fees are charged that include the dollars we'll need to upgrade, fix pipes, and do all those things. You can pay me now or pay me later. And you often get an issue when utilities are privately owned, they will pass on the true cost of maintaining the utilities to the people, to their customers. It's in their economic interest. When utilities are publicly owned, um, it's hard because the elected officials hate to be the ones perceived as raising the rates and fees, but those rates and fees need to keep up. So as you said, Zach, if we have more people are coming, we need better sewage treatment, we need lines replaced, we need septic to sewer, you have to build that into the rate structure. And then the elected officials need to, you know, sort of be brave enough to let people know this is an investment in the future. Even though we're going to raise your rates now, it's going to happen. Those rates need to go up, which you see private utilities do a lot more quickly than public utilities. And that's a problem built into the system for just one piece of that. So how does something like the the right to clean and healthy waters amendment um, at the at the state level impact um, these these types of conversations these types of um, you know um, the the pressure that may be put on agencies or anything um, to make those changes and to make them the forefront of discussions? I know they've been passed. I don't know what impact they've had, Dwayne. Do you understand? Have you seen impact coming out of those to, to date? I don't know specifics, but I do know that there are considerable laws in place at federal and state levels. Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act are two at the federal level. Um, a lot of times this is more about enforcement than whether you have you know, the legal capability and authority. Uh, I do think that we have some gaps, you know, in some of those regulatory oversight issues. Uh, but for the most part, you know, if you get a balance of regulatory and non-regulatory compliance and you have the public will to do it right the first time, everybody wins. And so there's a lot of talk about you know, standing and legal. And there's no question in the history of Florida and the nation, uh, lawsuits have kind of created oppor legal opportunities to go through brick walls that you couldn't have gone through without a lawsuit. But these lawsuits come also with cost. And if you're tied up in a 10-year lawsuit, very often nothing gets done on either side until that lawsuit. And so can I look at this from the standpoint of, you know, let's do the right thing. If you are a homeowner, a business owner, a municipality, a state agency, you know, look at your own footprint, look at what you are responsible for and fix your own problem. If we all would take responsibility for our individual and collective problems, we wouldn't be fighting the fight we're having right now. But there's no question that if you look back at the last 40 years, we made a lot of progress because of federal legislation, clean water, clean air. We have a long way to go because wastewater infrastructure, for example, doesn't handle some of the pollutant loads that come through current wastewater. And so I see that as a technology opportunity what does 21st century wastewater look like where pharmaceuticals and, you know, whatever drugs that you pour down your toilet that come through the system, these dissolved organics that we worry about, that we're taking care of all of that. No pollutants to ground, water, or air. That's the 21st century technology. And that's where I think the money needs to go, you know, getting us out of the 19th and 20th century mindset and jumping into what can new innovation do for efficiency, both on the pollution load reduction, but also on the cost reduction. Imagine if we could take a septic tank, you know, drop an apparatus that's only $4,000 and have total nitrogen and phosphorus removal. It'd be transformational. 
I also, I also think, and I just saw someone's uh, question there, um, you know, legislating is a messy process. And every year out of Tallahassee, we see a, a bunch of laws coming to strengthen our water quality. At the same time, new laws are often passed that weaken our water quality because it's not done in a consolidated way. And that's the, just the nature of our democratic process. So being the informed consumer who lets your legislators know what matters and you don't like to see these ones that open up to development that's not wise or smart is important and letting your elected officials know somebody's watching because stuff, it's hard. There's so much going on out of Tallahassee. Um, at a local, you see, you see a whole variety of bills and it feels to me often like it's two steps forward, one step back. And if we could, if we could get rid of the one step back and you know, let the governor know how you feel about those bills, um, there's a chance to just make it two steps forward, which would make a huge difference. Um, are there, so um, are there already fees in place for new construction impact fees or fee schedules that are starting to build that funding to say, okay, hey, you want to come in, you want to build whatever it may be, a house, a hotel, what have you, are though are there fees already being put into new projects that will that are starting to push us into that direction of the the twenty first century of of infrastructure? I think Senate Bill Seven Twelve at the state level set into motion some regulatory oversight, especially on wastewater and septic that that's going to force municipalities to address some of the you know some of the statutory impacts of of that clean water act at, at the end of the day though there's a lot of power within each municipality you know when you look at local impact fees and it varies from community to community and and the abilities of the community and the leadership uh, to see needs and where investments need to be and so the answer is there's no consistent, you know, yes or no on that. But there are communities that really understand that new growth rarely pays for itself. And that new growth, especially when it's sprawl, you know, out into more, you know, not out of the urban core, but into some of the what used to be agricultural lands, you know, that winds up costing us all unless there is an impact fee to cover those costs. Now, we often see uh, rollbacks on ad valorem taxes. And I've said this in public, that makes no sense to me economically, because that growth in ad valorem is about new growth coming into the state. And while politically, you know, it's something that's done at a lot of different levels, because more revenues are coming in because you have more growth, uh, but when you roll it back, you're basically saying, well, those new revenues, we're not going to take them. And then all of a sudden, after 10 years, you find yourself behind the eight ball uh, because you haven't done the incremental improvements to infrastructure. And then those costs really begin to balloon, you know, when you've kind of sat back. And so there's a lot of things that need to change in what I would call the economic equation of cost benefit and especially what is the return on investment and uh and a lot of times there are communities that are doing it great and some that you know still haven't quite understood you know that cost over time equation but i think there's a horizon issue these are long-term problems that need long-term yeah. and long-term funding and most elected officials are having to run for office fairly often in short so there are different pressures because uh, making those tough decisions and say, we're going to raise fees, we're going to raise taxes, we're going to do what we need to do for a long-term program doesn't necessarily uh, reward the, the brave elected official who says those things. So our system fights itself. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think that's a, a good segue because I think, you know, something we can all certainly do is put water and put our natural resources first at the ballot box wherever possible and do our best to hold um you know hold our officials accountable and make sure that they understand that it's important to us um but on a, a more you know uh 
not necessarily smaller level, because I don't want to imply that it's small, but on a more personal level, um, when we're talking about, um, you know, homeowners who live along the lagoon um you know they can yeah they can check to see if there is a if they're on a septic system uh, see if there's a conversion opportunity for them and what sort of upgrades might be available but are there other things that our you know local homeowners you know living on the lagoon can do you know we have some that are able to get involved with things like uh oyster gardening but not all of them because maybe the the waterway isn't right for healthy you know for for growing oysters right there what types of things in their in their own homes, you know, beyond sort of basic, um, you know, the basic conservation steps that we can all be doing to help our waterways, picking up, picking up our pet waste, not using fertilizers, you know, um, and all of planting Florida native plants in our yards and things like that. Um, are there ways to make more use of the water, you know, the waterfront homeowners? that want to be able to help, but can't necessarily grow oysters or something like that? There's a lot. Now, I'm going to just give you an example. A few weeks ago, uh, we did a tour with the board of directors at the Space Coast Economic Development Commission up in Cocoa. And I was really pleased that a number of the homeowners uh, with bulkheads right up against the Banana River had pulled their lawns out and put in artificial turf. It looks just like, you know, a perfect, you know, garden almost. And so there's some things you can do in landscaping. So native planting, you know, is really good. If you do it right, it can look beautiful. Uh, swales, just a slight swale at a road face uh, or on the back of your, your, you know, bulkhead and dock can catch water so you're not discharging water directly to the lagoon. And so there are a number of things. Rain barrels can help, you know, collect water where you can distribute it where you want. Now, one of the ones that's both the easiest, cheapest, but hardest behavior to beat, it seems, is the amount of litter that we see, you know, along our causeways in particular, you know, our keep, Brevard Beautiful and, and and all of the Keep America Beautiful uh, groups along the lagoon, they're picking up tons of trash every single week. And that's something that as communities, you know, we can get behind, you know, making sure that if you see litter, you pick it up. If you see somebody littering, you know, you try to gently intervene. But that's one that doesn't cost a dime, just you know, carry your trash and put it away properly and don't throw it on a shoreline somewhere. But yeah, there's a lot of little things, cutting back on fertilizer, pesticide, herbicides, only use it when you absolutely have to. And if you absolutely think you have to get a professional, you know, provider who's licensed so you're not exposing you and your kids and your dogs or grandkids to chemicals that you may not be trained to, to be administering. So a lot the homeowner can do that really makes a difference. And I would leave sort of one, I think we're wrapping up in a minute, something that really helped me years ago. Um, one of my colleagues pointed out that, you know, as people living in the United States, we make dozens of decisions every day that have environmental impact. For most people, it's really unreasonable to expect that every decision you make is going to be the right decision. You know, there are times you walk into the supermarket and I forgot my bags. You know, it's pouring rain. I'm not going to run out to my car. I'm going to use a plastic bag. Um, and uh, so, but if we all, whenever we can, when it's even fairly easy, make the right decision, it has huge impacts. That's when it adds up. It's the collective whole of those decisions. So, you know, I always tell people, you know, be aware of the decisions you make every day. Whenever you can, make the right, best decision. But don't kill yourself when you have to make a poor decision. We're all going to make poor decisions along the way. Um, I noticed some of the questions. It's always hard to balance. You know, is fake turf going to have microplastic issues? We're always balancing these things, right? So we, we want to take a look and make the best series of decisions we can on the best information, understanding that nobody's perfect. I think no one's a... a a true stoic, I guess there are people out there who are, 
Um, but if the great majority of people are conscious of decisions, we can move the needle forward. And I just want to add, thanks to all of you, we are making progress. So these projects and these behavior changes, we're starting to see the early benefits of all of this investment of time and talent. You know, you look at the number of volunteers that are coming to the Brevard Zoo for Restore Our Shores. Uh, that is how we're going to change the game for the lagoon. And we're in it for the long haul, but really we're only going to succeed if you as citizens and community leaders, you know, kind of join where you can, do what you can and when you can, and kind of have that clean water ethic. We call it lagoon friendly at the National Estuary Program. If you have an opportunity to be lagoon friendly, take the opportunity. And you don't have to be out there pointing fingers at anybody. You know, take care of your own business. And if we all did that, you know, I'm very confident we are not going to wait 25 years to see improvements. I'm confident we're seeing improvements already, even in a year where I expected to see some challenges with all the rain. Uh, but expect kind of a roller coaster ride over the next five or six years. We have to keep the resolve to keep doing this work, even if we take two steps forward and one step back, either because of the weather or a hurricane or just some other external factor we can't control. So stay positive, you know, stay committed and stay actively engaged. So I think you both kind of just already touched on it, but I'm going to just, um, I want to thank everybody for coming and, and participating for amazing questions. We've recorded the chat. We've recorded this. Like I said, we will send a follow-up email that we'll send. Um, we'll include a link to the recording once it's uploaded, um, address any major, you know, big questions that were asked by multiple people that we didn't get a chance to, as well as include links for volunteer opportunities, places to learn more, um, all of the, the types of things we've been discussing. Um, but I want to, I'm going to leave you both with just one last question. Um, if you could reach everyone who lives along, lives, visits, works, plays along the lagoon and permanently embed one thought or fact or, you know, idea into their head about the Indian River Lagoon, what would it be? Keith, you want to jump that first or you want me to? I want to hear your response first. So I think the most important thing is don't lose hope that we can solve this problem. You know, we cause the problem, but we can solve this problem. Uh, we are along this entire coastline, 156 miles of the east coast of Florida, some of the technically most advanced communities. And there isn't a single person who moves here who doesn't honestly love the quality of life. That's why we come here. You know, it's a great place to work, great place to play. Indian River Lagoon connects us all. So don't lose hope and think, number one, that nobody's doing anything or that it's hopeless. We can solve this problem and we can solve it, you know, not in decades and decades, but we can solve it over the next five to 10 years as long as we have resolve and we have hope. And we look at science to drive our decisions and not politics. Beautiful. All right, Mr. Winston. Oh, you stole my words. I was, I was <laughs> gonna literally say, the one thing to remember is that everybody can make a difference and actually we can fix this. So we're perfectly aligned, so. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, I think that's a fantastic spot to end it. Again, everyone, um, thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thank you, Michelle and Morgan, for um, running all of this on the back end and making sure that all of this worked for all of us today. Um, and thank you, everyone who signed up to participate. Again, keep your eye, keep an eye out for that email. Um, and we will be in touch. Please reach out in the meantime. If you have questions, you can um, reach us through the websites, both for um, the onelagoon.org or brevardzoo.org um, with information on volunteer opportunities, current projects that are going on. Thank you all so much for being engaged, being part of this, um, and for being out tonight. Have a great night, everybody.
Good night, everybody. Thanks.